Well, good morning, everyone, everywhere, and welcome to Worship with Home United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Lisa, and I am a grateful, long-term visitor on the land of the Nanilchik Village Tribe. The Nanilchik Village Tribe is the modern Alaska Native tribe located here on the southern Kenai Peninsula. Their descendants trace their roots back to the ancient peoples within these tribal boundaries. The Nanilchik Village Tribe generously offers services and outreach for tribal members and for everyone who resides in this area. They are committed to environmental stewardship, access to health, education, family resources, and cultural and artistic growth. I am grateful for the Nanilchik Village Tribe's ongoing stewardship of this incredible place that we live, and I commit myself to being a respectful neighbor. If you are worshiping here in person today, welcome. It is such a delight that we are able to gather together in the sanctuary and spend this time together this morning. And if you are worshiping with us online, thank you so much for joining us far and wide. The grand experiment continues, uh, and so I uh, appreciate everyone's patience as we learn how to incorporate the technology into our worship services. Today we are trying really hard to make sure that the audio is clear and the closed captioning features are work uh, working on our uh, online worship service. Um, and so we always appreciate feedback on what's working and what can be improved for our online experience. And we also ask for a lot of grace from everybody because we are still learning how to use all of this. After a year of flying solo with the technology, I am so grateful for our tech team uh, who's been working these last few weeks, Joe and Ella and Peggy and Mike, who have worked so hard to learn this new technology so that our whole congregation, regardless of where they are, can be worshiping together today. I am also grateful for our children who are here this week. It is so nice to see your face. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a lot about creation, which is the word we use for plants and animals and mountains and rivers and oceans and people. And another word we use a lot for creation is nature. So I asked this morning uh, for our kids in the audience that uh, if you have uh, one of our clipboards, I would love for you as you listen today, as you pray today, as you hear the words of scripture today, as you listen to the songs, I want you to draw your favorite parts of nature. It could be a place that you love to go camping, it could be your favorite animals, it could be vegetables that grow in your garden. Um, Miss Peggy put together clipboards, and if you are a child at heart and need something to do with your hands so you can listen better, you are also welcome to step out in the lobby and get a clipboard for yourself. But I would love to see your artwork after worship about your favorite parts of creation. As we begin our time of worship together, wherever you are, I invite you to take a moment to settle into the space, to feel firmly rooted in the holy ground on which you are living and working, playing and worshiping, and take just a moment to shed any cares of the world that you may have brought into this time and space this morning, and take a moment of silent prayer to turn your hearts and minds towards God in worship. Let us pray. Will you please stand as you're able for our call to worship today? Our prayer is a responsive one. So when I say, you created them, please respond with, you called them good. I'll say, you created them, and you respond, you called them good. Creator God, out of overflowing love, you created all things with rich variety and great beauty. You created them. You called them good. Plants and animals, land and sea, sun and moon and stars in the sky, you created them. You called them good. You entrusted us with responsibility for them. You created them. You called them good. Grant that we might so value all that you have given into our care that we may strive to sustain its 
blessings for all people through all time. You created them. You called them good. Give us the grace to use them rightly for your glory, for our own well-being, and for the relief of those in need. You created them. You called them good. Help us be keepers and healers of the earth and all her people. You created them. You called them good. Amen. You may be seated. Our opening hymn today is For the Beauty. Fish 
of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the wild animals of the earth and over the creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image and in the image of God he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish and the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth and every free with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast that of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was everything, and there was morning the sixth day. Well, actually, that was the evening, <laughs> and that was the morning, uh, the sixth day in the morning. Word of God, word of life. Thanks. 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 I love it when Brian reads. You do such an amazing job. Thank you, Brian. We had a scary experience in my family this week. My cousin's 25-year-old son went missing. He was expected to show up at a certain time to pick up his daughter, to drive her to her grandparents, my cousin's house, and he never showed up. He had called and told my cousin that he was gonna pull over and take a nap on the long drive. And she didn't hear from him again for four days. Nobody heard from him, he was just gone. No sign of him, no sign of the truck that he was driving. We've all lived through the disappearance of Duffy, Murnane, here, and Homer, and so we can imagine those frightening first days of not knowing, of not having any contact, no information, having to wait, not even being able to get police assistance until a certain period of time had passed. Having offered some pastoral care to Duffy's family and friends, I knew that there was not much I could say of comfort to my cousin whose son was missing. I could offer words of hope, words of prayer, words of love, but what she needed was concrete answers to where her boy was. I don't care that he was 25 years old. They're all still babies to their parents, right? The one word of comfort that I could offer was that wherever he was, God was with him. That just as she knew that God was with her, giving her strength, and giving her even what prayed the patience she had, wherever he was, he was not alone because God was with him. Unlike a lot of missing person stories, this one does have a happy ending. He turned up. I don't know the story. I may never know the story of what happened during those four days, what he did or where he went or what happened to him. Um, I may never know what those circumstances are, but I know all that I need to know is he once was lost and now he's found. So often we long for a God of rescue. A god like a knight in shining armor who will ride in on a white stallion and rescue us from whatever life's circumstances are. Rescue us from our problems, rescue us from our illness, rescue us from these bad experiences that happen in life. We want a god who will change the world in the way we want God to, with a magical snap of the fingers. But again and again, throughout the witness of scripture, we don't see a God of rescue. 
we see a God of presence. And that presence began before the beginning. As we heard Brian read so eloquently today, those verses from Genesis that remind us that in the beginning, God already was. God existed. God predates the beginning of anything that we know. In the beginning, there was God. And then God created. That means that every created thing is indwelt by God, that source of all life and light. We know that from the first chapter of the Gospel of John, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things came into being through the Word, which is life. These ancient stories tell us about the beginnings the before times, the origins. These types of stories are called etiological stories. They're stories about how things came to be. When there are questions like, why is the sky blue? Why are there oceans and mountains? Why are there land masses and valleys? Why are the plants in so many different colors and shades? Why are there animals in such variety? Why do human beings exist? The stories that answer those questions, why, are, uh, are the theological answers to those questions, these ideological stories. There are different kinds of questions that we can ask. If we want a biological answer to how Homo sapiens sapiens came to exist in our current form, we can turn to an evolutionary biologist. But if we want to know why are there humans our creation story tells us that there are humans because God wanted companionship and God wanted someone to steward this beautiful world that they created. That companionship is such a key part of this story. In the third chapter of Genesis, just after the second version of the creation story, we learn that God walked with those first people in the garden, in the cool of the evening. And I think one of our most basic desires is to return to that relationship with God, to be able to walk in the garden with God, to have that level of companionship and friendship and intimacy, to have that simple yet profound relationship. But here's the thing, we can have that relationship right now because God is present with us. Unfortunately, we are really good at distracting ourselves from that fact of building up barriers and things that cloud our vision, putting up walls and distractions that keep us from recognizing the presence of God with us. In the 17th century, there was a French Carmelite monk named Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence started out life named Nicholas Herman, and he was a peasant in France. And in his poverty, he decided to join the French army, probably because he knew he could get a hot meal there. But foot soldiers were not even fed that well, and so one day in the middle of winter, Nicholas found himself sitting in an orchard, staring at a barren tree. The tree didn't have any leaves on it. It wasn't bearing any fruit. And Nicholas, probably with his stomach growling, was staring at that tree, longing for the summer abundance. In a Christianity Today biography, he's quoted as writing this. Gazing at the tree, I grasped for the first time the extravagance of God's grace and the unfailing sovereignty of divine providence. Like the tree, I myself am seemingly dead, but God has life waiting for me, and the turn of the seasons will bring fullness. At that moment, he said, that leafless tree first flashed upon my soul the fact of God, and he was filled with the love of God that never ceased to burn. Now, you might assume that Brother Lawrence went on to become some great abbot or guru or pope or some great spiritual teacher, but that wasn't the case. Brother Lawrence lived out his life as a kitchen helper. 
He was not formally educated as far as we know, and what we know about him is mostly through a series of interviews that his abbot did with him when he realized what a humble and faithful young monk he had working in the kitchens. This week in Richard Moore's Daily Meditation, there are some quotes from Brother Lawrence that I want to share with you. Brother Lawrence said this, I don't practice any particular prayer discipline. I have no specific techniques I use to meditate. I know these methods work for some people, but for me, when I try them, I just spend all my time rejecting my wandering thoughts over and over. He says, I tried to practice these disciplines, but now I don't worry about them anymore. Their only purpose is to bring a person to union with God. Why should I fast or set aside particular prayer times or deny myself in some way when I have found a shortcut? If every moment I am consciously practicing love, if I am doing all things for God's sake, then I don't need to worry about those spiritual methods. Spiritual practices themselves had become one of those barriers between Brother Lawrence and his relationship with God. They made him feel separated from God because he wasn't doing them right. And I guess a lot of us can relate to that. We might commit ourselves to reading the Bible in a year, and Genesis and Exodus just fly by with all those famous characters and exciting stories, and then we get to Leviticus. And it's full of laws and rituals and ceremonies and feast days and sacrifices and cleanliness. And all of a sudden, scripture study does not bring us joy, but starts feeling a lot more like a slog. And instead of feeling inspired, we might start feeling resentful or burdened. The practice itself might start feeling like a barrier to our relationship with God. I've heard so many people say this, the same, uh, say the same thing like this about prayer, that they feel like they don't know the right words to say in prayer. So it makes them hard, it makes it feel hard for them to pray. Friend, what's prayer? Talking to God. Just talk to God, right? But because so many of you, and I knew I could call on Fran to say that, because if you ever want to know how to pray, just talk to Franny. She will tell you. Uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's this like seeming obligation that comes with prayer, like this is what good Christians do. But if people feel like they don't know the right words or the right times or the right rituals or what to say, then that sense of inadequacy can become a barrier in praying. Brother Lawrence struggled with all these things, those standard spiritual practices that do work for so many different people just did not work for him. And so this is what he said, I have abandoned all forms of devotion, all prayer techniques. My only prayer practice is attention. I carry on a habitual, silent, and secret conversation with God that fills me with overwhelming joy. This particular, particular spiritual habit modeled by Brother Lawrence became known as practicing the presence of God. Practicing, seeing, and feeling God's presence every single moment. It doesn't matter what we do as long as we do it with awareness. It didn't matter that Brother Lawrence wasn't a scholar or an abbot or a preacher. If he could chop carrots with attention, then he was practicing the presence of God. If he could scrub pots with attention, he was practicing the presence of God. It doesn't matter what it is that we do as long as we do it with awareness. It doesn't matter if we're driving or cooking or cleaning the bathroom or playing with our kids or weeding the garden or gutting fish or mowing the lawn or scrubbing the floor or changing spark plugs or hanging drywall. If we're doing it with attention, it is a spiritual practice as we practice the presence of God. Absolutely anything we do can draw us closer to God if we are aware of the presence of God with us. Brother Lawrence said this, when we walk in the presence of God, the busiest moment of the day is no different from the quiet of a prayer altar. Even in the midst of noise and clutter, while people's voices are coming at you from all directions, asking for your help with many different things, 
you can possess with God the same serenity as if you were on your knees in church. Practicing the presence of God helps us be aware of God in all things as the life force coursing through all of creation. And God's creative process never stopped. God is always making all things new if we are only aware. There are so many things that can pull us out of awareness. Brother Lauren's name, all that busyness of life that can distract us. But I experienced something different this past year. It wasn't necessarily the busyness of life. It was the sameness of life that could be just as distracting. Think about lockdown when one day floated to the next with nothing to differentiate one day from the other. I walked a path from bed to desk to table to bed over and over again until all the days blurred together and time had no meaning anymore. Days were just one big blur. That sameness can be numbing. It can make us feel like God is not present in the mundane. But if there's one lesson that we learned loud and clear this past year is that God does not live in these walls alone, that God is everywhere. There's a story in 2 Samuel in which King David, after bringing the ark to Jerusalem, is talking to his spiritual advisor, that prophet Nathan. And David says to him, I'm living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God is still in a tent. David felt guilty that he was living in this warm, dry palace and, and thought that he needed to build a shelter for God too. But God didn't feel that same way. Later, talking to Nathan, giving him words for David, God says, Do you think you're the one to build me a house to live in? I've not lived in a house since the day I brought your people up out of Egypt. I have moved about in a tent among the people of Israel, and I never said a word. Why haven't you built me a house? No, I have been with you wherever you went. God says, I don't need a house. I'm everywhere. So as we continue our practice this year, our slow summer, as we enjoy each day, let us practice the presence of God by opening our eyes to see God around us in all parts of creation. This is how we will once again walk in the garden with God. So this week I invite you to practice the presence of God on the boat, on the beach, in the riverbank. Practice the presence of God in your house, at work, in the car. Practice the presence of God doing chores, running errands, at rest. Practice the presence of God. And every single day, look for the holy all around you. Amen. Our song of response is Come and Find the Quiet Center. I invite you to hum along with Dave and Will as they share this song with us.
tell you about the person for 2021. This person has been very busy this year. During the last year, she's been our tech person. She's made our virtual UMW meetings available to all of us, as well as the UMW book group. She has also had to learn how to do an online auction, and she did an awesome job earning $20,000, $2,000 for missions for UMW. She also has been very active in our other capacities, such as Sunday School for our children. Our UMW, UMW honoree for 2021 is Peggy Ostrom. Thank you, Ruby. <laughs> 
was an unexpected honor. Thank you so much, Ruby, and thank you to the United Methodist Women's Group. I am deeply touched, thank you for that. And Peggy is absolutely deserving. She has done an incredible amount of work this past year, keeping our Sunday School program going strong. So thank you for honoring her as well. <clears throat> Didn't know I was going to cry. <laughs> as we enter into our time of prayer, I do want to lift up some of those people and situations that are going on in the life of our church. I ask for special prayers for the Van Zandt family. Bonnie did pass away. Fran and uh, some of the other family will be traveling down to California for her memorial service this week. Um, let us in particular keep Philip in our prayers with the loss of his wife. Um, I think the family is taking great comfort that she is not in pain and suffering anymore, but it was unexpected. And so please uh, pray for the Van Zandt family. I'd also ask for prayers for all of those uh, who are being impacted by wildfires right now in Oregon and Washington and California and other parts of the country. We know that last year's wildfire season was horrific and this year is on schedule to be worse. And so uh, the disaster response branch of the United Methodist Church is already meeting regularly and has response teams that are trained and are set to go as soon as the call comes out. Um, but please, special prayers for all of those impacted by wildfires. We know that we lost towns, neighborhoods, churches uh, last year. And so we pray uh, for all of those who are affected. We also pray for all of those in Europe uh, affected by the flooding. Uh, it has been uh, an unusual year where climate change is really coming home to roost in a lot of American and European uh, towns who have not experienced the effects of climate change like other countries have. And so I pray that we all are able uh, to continue to be influential in climate care uh, and influence our government and all of our leaders to make some real and lasting changes. I also pray for all of those people uh, who are still continuing to suffer because of the COVID pandemic. As much as we would like to believe it's over because we're bored and sick and tired of it, it does not mean that it is. And the Delta variant has uh, been impacting particularly the unvaccinated people. And there have been um, an incredible increase in number of cases here in our own town, as well as around the state, the country, and the world. And so the best thing that we can do is get vaccinated and encourage everyone we can who is able to be vaccinated at this point to do that. Um, and please continue in your own life to stay safe however you can, continue to distance, wash your hands, wear your mask, all those good things that you know how to do, the good habits that we've all created this year so that we can continue to keep our community safe. Um, just know that I am keeping a, a close eye on the rates here in town. Um, and if it ever comes to the point where the uh, pandemic has started to really ravage our town, then we will go back to online only worship. Um, so please just know that I am keeping a, a strict eye on those numbers and uh, we do have some guidelines to follow about when we do need to close the building again and, and have everyone worship from home. Um, so the best thing you can do is make sure you're subscribed to our church newsletter because that's where those announcements will come out. Um, but right now I pray that uh, everyone continues to stay safe and be vaccinated if possible and encourage friends and family too. So let us make sure that we are praying for all of those who are still suffering from COVID itself and from all of the side effects of COVID. Um, as we enter into our time of prayer, we are going to be praying a responsive prayer. This is uh, based on a prayer that might be familiar to you called the Canticle of Creatures, which is a prayer of St. Francis, who is known for his love of nature and the animals. Uh, this will be a responsive prayer. So when I say praise be to you, O God, please respond with blessed be your name. When I say praise be to you, O God, blessed be your name. We please stand as you're able for our time of prayer. <coughs> o most high, all-powerful, good Lord God, to you belong praise, glory, honor, and all blessings. Praise be to you, O God, blessed be your name. Be praised, my Lord, for all your creation, and especially for our brother's son, who brings us the day and the light. He is strong and shines magnificently. O oh Lord, we think of you when we look at him. Praise be to you, O oh God. Blessed be your name. Be praised, my Lord, for Sister Moon and for the stars which you have set shining and lovely in the heavens. Praise be to you, O God. Blessed be your name. Be praised, my Lord, for our brothers, wind and air, 
and every kind of weather by which you, O Lord, uphold life in all your creatures. Praise be to you, O God. Blessed be your name. Be praised, my Lord, for our sister water, who is very useful to us and humble and precious and pure. Praise be to you, O God. Blessed be your name. Be praised, my Lord, for our brother fire, through whom you give us light in the darkness. He is bright and lively and strong. Praise be to you, O God. Blessed be your name. Be praised, my Lord, for Sister Earth, our mother, who nourishes us and sustains us, bringing forth fruits and vegetables of many kinds and flowers of many colors. Praise be to you, O God. Blessed be your name. Be praised, my Lord, for those who forgive for the love of you, and for those who bear sickness and weakness in peace and patience. You will grant them a crown. Praise be to you, O God. Blessed be your name. And be praised, my Lord, even for our sister death, whom we all must face. I praise and bless you, Lord, and I give thanks to you, and I will serve you in all humility. Praise be to you, O God. Blessed be your name. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you once again for your continued generosity. Your gifts and donations help us maintain the ministries and missions of the church and reach out to those in our community who are in need. And if you'd like to make a donation today, our donation box is in the back of the sanctuary. You're welcome to drop cash or check in as you go, um, or you're also welcome to give online. If you are one of our online congregation today, you can visit our website at www.homerumcalaska.org slash donate, or send a check to 770 East End Road, Homer, Alaska, 99603. We are all so appreciative of your generosity. Our closing song today is God Will Take Care of You. And once again, I invite you to hum along with Will and Dave, for God will take care of you.
Go forth today with the joy of the Lord on your lips. Go forth with the peace of God in your hearts. Go with the strength of the Holy Spirit in every step you take. Go forth today in peace and love. Amen. Amen. Amen.